we can welcome on stage Stani Mira Vlaiva. Uh, thing about you, then you, you will present yourself, uh, of course, but I, I'd like to tell you that she owns uh, like three guitars, am I right? But <laughs> she doesn't know how to play them <laughs> because she just uh, keeps buying uh, guitars because she likes them. And maybe one day she'll learn how to play. Okay, that said, so the stage is yours, and thank you, Sunimira. So, because we work with APIs, a lot of our problems come from working with our backend team. And this kind of miscommunication uh, happens because either teams don't communicate or because the technology that we're using isn't optimal for what we're trying to build. Most of us probably has used REST APIs and have consumed REST APIs in your Angular applications. REST stands for representational uh, state transfer. Is there someone who hasn't heard about REST? Oh, we all use REST. It's, it's pretty much a standard way to build APIs, right? And let's imagine for a moment that we are building a movie catalog application. And naturally, we want to display the list of our movies. All right, so long story short, we are building a REST API for a movie catalog. The first page that we want is a list with all the movies. So naturally, we create a movie send point in our REST API that can give us a list with all the movies. But then, in order to optimize our website, we realize that we don't need all the fields from the movies document that is saved in the database. So we need only the titles, really. But we can optimize that by introducing a new endpoint, movies titles. And then someone comes over and says, this is not really following the REST standards. You can do that sort of endpoints. It's really ugly. Uh, so you say, OK, what about I introduce a parameter to filter all the fields and filter and retrieve only the title? Yeah, you can do that. Then you start optimizing your application more. And the next page that you build is the movie details page. And for that page, you need to get the information about the movie that you're presenting and also the comments that users left for that movie. And since these are two separate system entities and two separate maybe tables or collections in your database, following the REST standard, they should be separate endpoints. So in order to get all the needed information for that page, you need to send two requests. And that can kind of grow. Uh, for certain pages, you might have to send 10 requests to get all the information that you need. And this results in many round trips between the server and the client, which is not really optimal. So you decide, OK, I will optimize that. And I will create a new endpoint called movie with comments. And over time, uh, after a few iterations, after a few releases, you end up with one really, really big REST API. And your front end developers start to suffer because they start to find it really hard to find the correct endpoint to use uh, in their client applications. So as you can see here, this can come from miscommunication between backend and frontend teams. It can come because of the limitations of the REST technology and specification. So what if there was a better way to build our APIs, a way that can optimize this kind of communication? And the technology that I'm going to talk about today, many people say that is a solution to this problem that we saw. And definitely, it's a good technology to know about. It's not a solution that will fit every use case, but still, as a front-end developers, or especially as back-end developers, it's something that you should kind of know about that is, it exists. So what is GraphQL? Well, first, GraphQL, what, it, what it's different from REST is that you have a single endpoint by default. And usually, this is called the GraphQL endpoint. And you can request all the resources that you need or send uh, resources to save in the database or update using this single endpoint by sending a declarative operation. So with this operation, we describe to the API that we want to get the movies from the database. And we want to get only the title field for every movie. 
And the GraphQL API is going to respond with exactly the data that we need without anything extra that we don't really need. We're going to get an array of movies, and we're going to have only the title field for each of them. We can even nest objects. So if we have an IMDb um, object inside our movies object, we can say, OK, give me also the IMDb object. And from that object, I want just the rating. And in a return, we're going to get exactly the data that we requested. Nothing more, nothing less. What is even cooler is that we can pass in, obviously, arguments. We can request a specific movie by passing a movie ID. And then we can use that uh, when we're resolving the movie field and to request the exactly that movie. And the even better part is that we can request multiple different system entities within the same request. So we can request both the movie with that certain ID and all of the comments for that movie with a single request. But what is GraphQL? Let's take a step back and before seeing it in action, let's explain what exactly is this GraphQL thing. Well, it's a specification. And in that specification, we have the GraphQL query language and also the GraphQL server side runtime. So the first part of the definition is GQL, the query language, or how we send requests to our APIs. In the query language, we have two types of operations, queries that allow us to fetch data. This corresponds to HTTP GET requests. And we also have mutations that allow us to mutate or change data. And this corresponds to put, post, or delete. And naturally, the most common protocol that we use when using GraphQL APIs is HTTP, but we're not tied to it. So we can use different protocols as well. So this is a simple request. We saw that already. And if we take a look at it part by part, in the beginning, we have the operation type. It can be either query or mutation. Then we have the name of the operation. We choose this name. We can write whatever we want. And then we have the variables that we can pass in. So our application can pass these variables when sending requests. Beneath that, we have fields. So movie, title, year, all of these are fields. And our API, our backend implementation, should know how to resolve these, uh, these fields. And we can also pass in arguments for each of the fields that we query. The other part of the definition is the runtime. And in this context, runtime means the execution environment in which we are executing our queries. This is defined by the GraphQL specification. We won't write our own API today because, first of all, we are at the front end conference. And second of all, because my company offers an out of the box solution for an API. So I'll show you that naturally. And uh, the third most important part about GraphQL is that we, we have a def clearly defined type system. So when we define the API, we need to define a schema. And in that schema, we define all the available operations that our API can execute. We define all the input arguments that our operations accept and all the responses what, that we can expect from that API. And by that, we have a clearly defined contract that our front end and our back end can communicate with. And this is different from REST. In REST, we don't have types. They're not really part of the REST specification. Another thing that is important here is that based on that schema that we have defined, uh, in JavaScript, we can use a package to generate automatically the TypeScript types based on that schema and use them in our Angular application. The best way to learn something new is by building something with it. So let's build an application. And obviously, I can't type with one hand here. Also, I'm not going to bore you with my live coding skills. But we're going to see a bunch of code on slides. Or not. And we're going to see it for a really short period of time. So you don't have to understand everything. There's going to be a QR code at the end with all the code and the slides and the application that we built. So you can check it out. And yeah, let's, let's get started. <laughs> yeah.
this is the app that we will be building. Movie catalog, we have movie details, comments. Uh, we can add comments. We'll also be able to load more comments from the database. And all that will be implemented using Angular and a GraphQL API. So we will see how to use a GraphQL API to achieve all that querying data, adding new data, and loading more. All right, this is the typical architecture of a web application that uses a GraphQL API. So starting from the left, we have some front-end framework that defines queries, operations that we want to execute. And then we usually have a GraphQL client library that takes care of converting these queries to actual requests. This library sends the requests, typically over HTTP, to a GraphQL API. Now, the GraphQL API can be simply a gateway to many services that we might have on the front end. We might have multiple databases, multiple microservices, and this API can simply be the gateway point to access them. And in our specific example, starting from the left, we will use Angular for the web application. We will use the Apollo Angular client library to send GraphQL requests. For the API, we'll use the MongoDB Atlas GraphQL API. And finally, this is going to be connected to a MongoDB Atlas database that will hold our movies data. All right, let's start from the database setup. Now, what is MongoDB Atlas? Uh, many of you may have heard about MongoDB, which is a document database. Well, MongoDB Atlas is the cloud uh, solution for MongoDB that offers a cloud hosting for your database, and also a set of application development services. And we'll see some of them today. Now, after you create your free account in MongoDB Atlas, you can deploy a database. And we'll see how you can do that. I'm going to select the share database, which is free. And you can use it very successfully for a large amount of apps. Then you can select your cloud provider and the region that you want. And the last thing that we need to do is actually give our cluster a more meaningful name. After we click Create Cluster, we can set up a user for accessing the database. And we can do that here from the interface. And the other security feature that we need to set up is uh, what IP should we be able to access the database from. So I can just add my current IP here, and that's, that's everything I need for setting up the database. After the cluster is created, uh, we can load a sample data set. So this is a data set that is preloaded by the platform, and we can add it to our cluster. And from that sample data set, we will use um, a movies data set that is already available so that we don't have to feed it uh, any additional data. When it's loaded, we can browse the collections that are available. And here we see the sample MFlix database. And inside it, we have comments and movies. These are the two collections that we should care about today. And if you're not familiar with document databases, collections are uh, tables in uh, relational databases. So in the comments collection, we have a reference to the movie that this comment is about. And in the movie collection, we have a very large document with all sorts of information about this movie. And one of our goals is going to be to not fetch all that information about the movie, but fetch exactly the data that we need. All right, we have the database, we loaded some data, and now we can create the API. And as I said, we're going to use a MongoDB Atlas GraphQL API. So I'm going to show you really quickly how to create that. So when you have your database, you can go ahead to the tab next to your database and create a new MongoDB Realm app. It's already linked to your database, so you don't have to link it manually. You can give it a meaningful name, and you can choose the deployment model as well, or use the default one. You see the app ID. So the app ID is going to be the first um, piece of information that we need for authenticating our requests. So I'm going to add it to the environment TS file in Angular, because that's the easiest one I can use. Then I need to set up access rules for my data. 
So I need to set up access rules for first the movies collection. And to keep this demo simple and short, I will allow access from everyone who connects to the database. So they can write and read everything. Super um, great security pattern. And I will do the same for the comments collection. Of course, you can use a lot more sophisticated access rules uh, by figuring out who is accessing the data, giving them roles, and allowing them to do certain things depending on the data they're trying to access. OK, after I have set up um, access rules, I can set up a schema. Now, as I said, GraphQL is strongly typed, so I, can, I should define a schema. Luckily, I can just generate schema from the data that is already in the database. And um, as you can see, there's a lot of fields here with their types. I can run validation to make sure all the data matches this schema. And then I will repeat and do the same for the comments collection as well. So we generate a schema using a sample of the data that is already in the database. And here, the only difference is that we have the movie ID, which is a reference to the other collection. That's why we are going to add a relationship so that we can resolve movies based on their comments and vice versa. So we're going to link the movie ID from this collection back to the movies collection. And after we do that, we now have access to the GraphQL tab. And we can test our GraphQL API here. As you can see, we get automatically an endpoint uh, that is leading to our GraphQL API. We also need that in order to send requests. And now we can try and run a query. So for example, I can query movies uh, with their title. And when I run this query, I get the data that that is already in the database. Similarly, I can, with the same operation, query comments. And if I type in movie ID here, this is going to resolve the full movie document because uh, the graphical interface already knows that this movie ID is linked to the other collection. So I can select specific fields for the movie, and when I query, I will get them. And I have them as an object in the movie ID document. Now, the last piece of information that they need in order to authenticate is some sort of API key. So I'm going to enable the API key provider. I will save that. And after I save it, I can generate an API key. All right, we get our API key, we add that to the environment PS file, and we are ready to authenticate. That's all we took to create the GraphQL API to kind of play with and demonstrate how to use GraphQL. All right, next, up to the fun part. How do we use GraphQL in Angular? So I'm going to use the Apollo Angular library, which is also an NPM package. And it also has an ng-add schematic. So I can ng-add it to my project. And when I do that, um, a GraphQL module is going to be generated, and it's going to be also registered in the root engine model. What, it, what the ng-add schematic is not going to do is authenticate our uh, request. So in order to authenticate, I will use the Realm Web uh, package and the information that I just added to the environment TS file. So how do we authenticate? And you're going to need to do that if you use any sort of authenticated GraphQL API with Angular. So it took me a while to uh, figure it out. So I'm very proud to share with you how you can do it. First, you need to get an access token from whatever API you're trying to access. And in this case, I'm using the Realm package. So I um, create a new Realm app using the app ID from environment TS. Then I login using the credentials, in this case, the API key. And uh, if I'm already logged in, I refresh the token, because usually tokens need to be refreshed after a certain period of time. 
And finally, I return the access token. So this is the function that does all that. And it's, as you can see, it's also synchronous. So we can just call it uh, on every request. So we have the get access token function. And now we need to attach that token to the authorization header before sending the actual request. And it, we need to do that for every request. So in order to do that, you need to create a special function that the Apollo Angular library expects called uh, create Apollo that should return an HTTP link or an object with an HTTP link. So first we create the HTTP link by providing the um, address of our uh, API. And then we use this special set context function to actually get the token and attach it to the header. And then finally, we concatenate this authorization part with the actual HTTP link. And we can enable cache. Uh, Apple Wenger has a very sophisticated caching mechanism that you can check out. And uh, it can give you some problems. So you might need to be aware that it exists in order to disable it for certain requests. So that's how we authenticate. And the rest of the setup is done uh, by the NGAD schematic. So finally, how do we send requests? Well, we can send them directly from our components, or you can uh, move them to a service and use that. I'm going to send them from the components, because I think it's, it's kind of clear enough and don't, doesn't need to be separated in a se separate service. All right, so first, we want to fetch all the movies that we want to show in the movies list page. In order to do that, I need to import the Apollo service from Apollo Angular and also GQL, which is going to give me uh, some highlighting for, for the actual query that I wrote here. Then I need to prepend this string with GQL. And inside it, I can define this actual query. So it might look like a string, but it has syntax highlighting and autocomplete, so it's actually pretty um, nice to write. So we write a query to get all movies. We select the movies field. We limit the movies that we want to 20. And then we can also send a more sophisticated query. In this case, I want to get all the movies that have more than 10 comments. Then we uh, enlist all the fields that we want from these movies. Then I will define an observable for my movies. I will import the Apollo service in the component and uh, on the ng on init hook, I will actually execute this query or send the operation using this Apollo watch query. This returns an observable. I subscribe to value changes. And then I map the result so that I can extract exactly the movies from the returned response. And since this is an observable, we can just subscribe to it uh, using the async pipe and display everything that we need. That's, that's pretty, pretty simple, nothing uh, non-standard in this uh, example. And that's how you use Apollo uh, to query data from a GraphQL API. But it, there's nothing special here. What about querying, yeah, if we get the nice catalog. What about querying multiple entities? Again, the problem that we had with REST is that in a specific case, we want to access two separate collections. So with REST, we can either send two requests or define one non-standard endpoint to get both the movies and the comments. And the cool part is that with GraphQL, you can do that without defining any special endpoint. You can just define everything that you want in your request and send it. And it's going to be just one request. So how do we do that? Well, we actually saw that query earlier. It's pretty simple. We just enlist everything that we need. And in this case, we will also filter by movie ID. So we are going to query movie and query the argument that we want. We will select only the fields that we need again. Then we will query for comments, again, by filtering by this movie ID. We can even nest this query. We will limit the comments. We can even sort the comments uh, by using the API that we defined. And yeah, we will select all the fields that we need. And all that by using the default out of the box API that was generated based on our data. We don't have to define anything special to sort, to limit, or to even filter by uh, ID. And 
how does that look? Well, pretty much the same thing. Uh, we just subscribe to the parameters in order to extract the ID of the movie that we're trying to display. Then we send a query with a POWO. We attach the argument in the variables um, field. Then we subscribe and uh, we resolve all the data that we need from the response. Super simple. And what we get is a nice page with all the information that we need and just a single request to get that information. All right, but how do we modify data? Yeah, no need to clap. We clap enough. Next, we are going to learn how to change data with, uh, with GraphQL. And to do that, again, we use a different operation, which is called a mutation. And we will also use uh, a resolver function. And in this case, because um, we generated this API, the resolver function was created for us. But as a bit of an additional information, every field should have an attached resolver function in your API. And if you're building your own API, you will have to define all these functions. And this sounds a bit of a um, kind of annoying to write, and it really is. So um, for now, if you're just playing with GraphQL, you can use the automatically generated API. It's going to do all that for you. So we already have this defined insert one comment function, and we can just use it as though we were uh, querying data. But instead, we're going to pass in data, and this is going to insert the comment into a database. So again, instead of query, we say mutation. We give it uh, whatever name we want. In this case, add comment. We pass in the comment. And again, this type was also generated for us, comment insert input. And it matches uh, the document that we have in the database based on the schema that we generated. And then we go insert one comment. And we provide this comment as the data argument. And then as a response, we can also select what we want. In this case, we want to get back the name, the text, and the date for the newly created comment. And how do we use that inside the component? Well, instead of disapple query or watch query, we say disapple mutate. We uh, specify the mutation. This is the uh, variable that we just defined. And we specify the variables. And that's everything. As a result, we get insert one comment object. And we can just append that to our comments, or we can either um, refetch all the comments if we want to be sure that this matches everything that we um, have created. In this case, we get the object that we get back from the response, and we just attach it to the top of the array. And this is how it looks like when we add a new comment uh, to the website. So we type in the comment, we press add, it takes a second to add it to the database, and it's now appended on the top because it's the newest comment. And it's really as simple as that. So let's see something a bit more complicated. And these are custom resolvers. So in your GraphQL API, you can define a new function that resolves something more specific. And in this case, something more specific might be um, implementing uh, pagination. So in the case that I have, I will just add a add more button to resolve the next five comments from the database. And in order to do that, I will need to use a few more specific operators, uh, the limit and skip from MongoDB. So I will implement that um, as a separate function. So what, what is the idea here? We have five comments, so we skip the first five comments, and then we want to load, let's say, five more comments. So we limit the number of documents that we get back by five. And we do that by increasing the number of skip comments every time to get the next five. That's how we can implement infinite scroll as well um, in, in your applications. So let's define the new function. You can do that again from Atlas. and these functions, they are kind of not the same, but very similar to AWS, AWS Lambda functions or cloud functions in Google Cloud. You're, you're familiar with this. So basically, they're just a piece of JavaScript code that can be executed by the platform in the cloud, not by you. And we are going to uh, give this function some name, and we are going to give it 
a piece of JavaScript to be executed, and that's that's everything. We can trigger it from the GraphQL API. So we extra we give it some arguments. We extract these arguments. Then then we say what the sort order should be. We select the collection using the injected service. Then we filter the comments so that there are comments for this specific ID, uh, for this specific movie. After we filter the comments, we sort them using dot sort. Then we skip a certain offset. We limit them to whatever limit we passed. And finally, we convert that to an array and return it. Like, super simple. All right, we defined this function. And now we just have to hook it up into our GraphQL API. To do that, we head back to GraphQL. We go to custom resolvers, add a new custom resolver, give it a field name. So this is going to be the field that we can query. And it could be comments offset. The type is query. We select the function that should be executed. The input time type is custom. This is all the arguments that we saw. And this should return a list of comments. We save our application, and we can go and see how to use that custom resolver. And the answer is the same way we use any other query in our API. So we just pass in the input. This is the specific input that we saw. So the sort order, the limit, the offset, and the movie that we want the comments for. And then we just query this new field that we have created. And we get back the name, text, and date for the comment. And we use it in the same way, using this Apollo query. And what we get back, we just attach it to the existing comments. As simple as that. The result is that we have this button that is hooked to the request. And we can load more comments from the database automatically with super minimal effort. And that's it. So they, what we saw is what exactly is GraphQL? How is it different from the REST specification? How we can create an API that we can play with for free? Uh, how we can set up the Apollo client, which is kind of the de facto standard to use GraphQL for Angular, or at least the easiest way to do it. We saw how we can query data and also change data using queries and mutations. And we also saw how we can create our custom resolvers in order to uh, create pagination or infinite scroll or whatever we want. So what is important to take away is that GraphQL doesn't have to be hooked to a single database that we can access. Uh, it can be just a gateway to all of our services. And if we were to build our own API, we can actually get whatever data we want from anywhere we want and return that from a single endpoint. So this is the real power of GraphQL. It's, it's kind of a gateway that we can use to access all data by sending a single request from our front end. And with that, this is the QR code that I promised you. It's going to take you to um, a tweet. You can give me a follow. And you're going to also see a link to the slides and a link to the GitHub repo with that, um, with that application. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we have time for a question or two. Anyone here? Thank you. Um, do you have any specific use cases where we should choose um, GraphQL over REST API or some pros and cons that uh, compare just to compare REST and uh, GraphQL and choose the right one? Well, it really depends. As you saw, like GraphQL solves that problem where you can like send just a single request to resolve multiple data endpoints. Uh, but it's definitely a bit harder to implement an API because you have to write a resolver for every single field that you want to request, unless you use some pre-generated API at first. Uh, so yeah, it's easier, easier to use on the front end, but it's harder to implement as an API itself. And there could be some security considerations as well because um, yeah, you can send whatever query you want. And unless you block list some queries, this can create a security breach for your system. OK. 
I wanted to ask you if um, we could use the generating schema definition of our API to get auto-completion suggestion when defining operations for our queries and notations on the front end. Yeah, I think you can. I'm pretty sure you can. There's a VS Code extension for Apollo that should be able to pick up the schema. And uh, I mean, you should have it locally, of course, and give you auto-complete. Something else? Okay. Thank you. Uh, let's see a set of REST API. Uh, GraphQL put can be used as a like middle layer between front end and the already existing APIs. Yeah, definitely it can be. I mean, it's going to slow you down a little bit because you have to send first a request to GraphQL and then to everything else you want. But yeah, it can be used as a middleware. And a lot of people do that, actually, because they use third-party REST APIs, and they use their GraphQL APIs, uh, again, as a gateway to that. Hi, I wanted to ask about validation. So uh, are there out-of-the-box validations on the server side? Or I so saw you, you wrote the function, and uh, whether we can reuse this for the um, for the client side as well. So for validation, yeah, definitely out of the box there is validation based on the schema that you define, and you can tune in if it should throw an error, if you get some corrupted data, or it should fail silently. Because in document databases, for example, you may have like flexible schema, so one document may differ from another, and the first document may not match the schema that you have defined. So what you get back, you should always check it or yeah, um, tune in the validation of the GraphQL server. So, yeah, and the second one, what was it? The function. I'm not sure. I think the API should give you the error when you request. If the data that you get back is not is not matching, so, yeah, I think this should be the, the the job of the API itself. I think. Okay. Anyone else? No, I don't see any hands. So, thank you very much, Sanira. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.